Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to Final Fantasy XIV Story Mode. There's no time for pleasantries. We've got so many problems we have to help with. Heretics digging ice tunnels. Some sort of spy within our ranks. Probably several others I forgot. Just so many problems. They need our help. Alphano, what's up? Alphano is eager to hear Ilbert's report on the ivy. Right. So, how's it going? Making small talk till he gets here. Here we go. Captain Ilbert, your report, if you will. I, Commander. Firstly, with regard to the heretic we captured, I regret to say that the man could tell us not that we did not already know of Shiva. We've since handed him over to the Ishgardian authorities. Henceforth, the Holy See will pursue the matter independently. Our inquiries concerning the Ivy, however, have proven more fruitful. We've ascertained the channel by which the heretics acquired their information on the shipment routes. Go on. You'll recall the flame we first identified as being in the Ivy's employ. From him, we were able to trace a trail of conspirators, each taking us closer to his master. Alas, the trail came to an abrupt end. Fearing that the investigation had been compromised, we took the necessary step of detaining all suspected of conspiracy. There were five on our list, including a flame stationed at Revenant's Toll. The man's primary duty was to keep an inventory of donations from abroad, the particulars of which he would share with benefactors, thereby ensuring that needs did not go unfulfilled. By virtue of his role, he was privy to the details of all shipments bound for the settlement. Needless to say, that included those originating from House Forton. He knew the precise route the caravan would take, and he sold that information to a merchant. I think I can guess which one. None other. With a little encouragement, he soon confessed to knowingly aiding and abetting the heretics. Well, that's one mystery solved, at least. But what of the ivy? Are we any closer to prizing off his mask? I dare say we are, Commander. Our relentless pursuit has forced him to commit a grave error. In a desperate bid to cover his tracks, the Ivy resorted to exercising certain administrative powers available only to high-ranking members of the Immortal Flames. If you consider, then, that our investigation is known to barely a handful of them, the field of suspects is greatly narrowed. You mean to say that the Agent is among Raban's innermost circle? Someone who's been with him since the Immortal Flames establishment? Tis the most plausible explanation. The infiltration likely occurred during the company's founding, with the groundwork for the act being laid beforehand. To slip into a position of authority unremarked and remain above suspicion all these years. Aye, I, I too was surprised, though I really should not have been. Of the three grand companies, Uldaz was ever the most vulnerable to infiltration. Both Limsa Laminsa and Gridania had long-standing armed forces that lent themselves well to the formation of the Maelstrom and the Order of the Twin Adder. To all intents and purposes, it was the same people. Loyal ones, mind, under the same leadership. Only the banner was different. Not so with the Flames. Uldaz's military was made up of disparate orders, most of which were glorified mercenary companies that answered only to their own paymasters. Hardly an ideal environment in which to establish something as high-minded as a grand company. The difficulties Raoban faced when fa founding the Immortal Flames were well known. Even after he'd convinced his fellow Syndicate members to share the costs, there remained the small matter of finding enough bodies to fill the ranks. Indeed, and given the pressing nature of the Imperial threat, that meant recruiting every passing sellsword. Amidst the chaos of its founding, it would have been child's play to infiltrate the company. A good deal easier than now, aye. The Immortal Flames have ever been caught between conflicting interests, the public and the private. Though the Monetarists ultimately agreed to support the, uh, the organization's founding, it was not out of charity that they did so, but simple self-preservation. Had Nail Von Darnus's ambitions been any less apocalyptic, you may be sure that they would never have risked supplying Raban with an army. It is but a wonder they did not attempt to extinguish the flames the moment the danger had passed. <clears throat> Returning to the present. Even as we speak, our Dolmen allies are shadowing several high-ranking flames, any one of whom could be the Ivy. Desiring to deal a blow against the Empire, the refugees were eager to lend us their aid. I expect to hear from them ere long. Very good. Pray continue your investigation with the first. Meanwhile, have the second attend to the unrest. The third can join the fourth in inspecting crystal shipments. If they notice anything unusual, I want to know about it. 
If Shiva is summoned in like manner to the other primals, the heretics will be looking for further supplies. Understood, Commander. I shall send word to Sir Emmerich, informing him of our success in identifying the heretics abettors. Hopefully the information will be of some use to the Ashgardians. It is time, Commander. Yes, I'm aware. An emergency council of the Alliance leadership has been called. There have been developments in Garlemald, it would seem. As commander of the Crystal Braves, my presence has been requested. I would have you accompany me, Dermon. As the realm's stoutest champion, tis only meet that you be present for the discussion. Oh, and the antecedent has already given her consent, lest you worry. Well, so long as you got field trip permission. Okay, what? Oh, still things to say, huh? What of you? What do you have to say? Upon the honor of the Crystal Braves, I swear I shall not rest until the Ivy's unmasked and in chains. Well, good to know. Like me, you are doubtless eager to conclude our business with Iceheart, but until another path to her sanctum is found, she'll remain beyond our reach. Minfilia and the Archons are sparing no effort to secure an alternate route. Until such time as they succeed, I suggest we give some thought to the realm's other problems. I shall go on ahead to Gridania in readiness for the coming council. Meet me at Nofaka's altar, and we'll make our way to the Lotus Stand together. All right, go team and such. I'll meet you there. Still eggs everywhere. <laughs> what a mess. I'm here. My thanks for coming, Dermon. When you're ready, speak with the Conjurer yonder. She'll show us to the Lotus Stand. That I shall do. Oop, pardon me. The Alliance leaders await you at the Lotus Stand. Will you be joining them now? Oh, yes, I will. Hello, hello, everyone. Change has come to the Garlean Empire, and we must discuss the implications. The rumors are true, then? The War of Succession is ended. It is. A new emperor reigns in Garlemald. Who? The birth and all too rapid expansion of the Garlean Empire is commonly attributed to the strategic brilliance of Solus Zosgalvis, yet he did not rule alone. Several members of the royal household also distinguished themselves during his reign. Nevertheless, it was the eldest son who stood to inherit the throne, until his most untimely passing. I thought us fortunate when I learned that the Emperor had died without naming a successor. Would that the Garlean Empire had died with him. Twas the grandson and his uncle who had the strongest claims, was it not? Yet claims count for little without the power to assert them. High Legatus Varus Ye Galvis is a respected military leader, not so his uncle. So young Varus has torn the crown from his uncle's grasp and taken his place at the head of the Empire. Given the troubled nature of his succession, 
The new emperor will require time to seal his grip on power. Yet have no doubt but that he shall, for there are none left with strength enough to oppose him. Since the success of Operation Archon, the remnants of the 14th Legion and the forces occupying Alamigo have done naught but fortify their positions. But you can be sure they'll be ready to march on us again, if their Emperor gives the word. When? Not if. They say this Varus was so set upon Eorzean annexation that he spoke out against the Meteor Project. Plainly, the new Emperor's intentions are of great concern to us all. I propose that we set aside the Cartano dispute for the present, and discuss what measures the Alliance might take to prepare for a resumption of hostilities with Garlemald. Moreover, I move that we re-examine the question of how our former allies in Ishgard might be persuaded to retake their place at our side. Could Eorzea but stand as one, twould deal a grave blow to our enemy's ambitions. Well, I suppose we should be grateful that they have finally acknowledged the inevitability of Imperial attack. Who knows? They may even do something about it. If only the leaders of Ishgard would follow their example and stop hiding behind their gates, praying for the coming storm to pass them by. But that is a discussion for another time. At present, I am more concerned by the fact that the Alliance's mooted preparations will be made known to the Garleans many moons before their coming. So long as the Ivy eludes our grasp, no secret is safe. I don't know if that's a thing to smile about, Dermon. Sorry, he was just thinking of a funny joke. Anyway, um, I'll know. It will not have escaped your notice that the nations of Eorzea are no nearer to being of one purpose, despite their protestations to the contrary. Plainly, the threat of a resurgent Garlemald is not enough to stir them. And the reason for this? Deep-rooted mistrust amongst the citizenry. The nation's leaders can come to all the understandings they'd like, but their unity means little and less to the common folk. Take the Lamincens, for instance. Though Admiral Merlib outlawed piracy over a decade ago, foreigners still picture the nation as a haven for grog-swilling, wooden-legged cutthroats. In likewise, the Gridanians are marked, uh, mocked as hermits who talk to trees, and the Uldans scorned as swindlers who worship coin. Not that such sentiments are entirely without grounds, of course. Take that pillar of Uldan society, Telegi Adelegi, for example. But that's beside the point. The fact is that people are wary of outsiders, whether they have cause to be or not. On that basis, one could argue that the conflict at Cartano is a necessary evil. Each nation has its own warmongering faction that advocates the acquisition of Omega. In order to placate them, we present them something resembling warfare and thereby curb their appetite for full-scale conflict. But enough idle musing. Let's speak of a more pressing matter, the Ivy. It is really kind of fascinating that they still... They didn't just introduce some story elements to justify a PvP mode existing. They continue referencing that story element... Like, that PvP element as a story element in the main story now and then. <laughs> the fact that they still do kind of staged battles not to the death out in the Cardinal Flats, kind of vying for power and control over that area and the resources there is still something that they'll reference from time to time, even though it's literally just a PvP mode <laughs> that most people don't even like. Anyway. Since we spoke at the Observatorium, Captain Ilbert has further shortened his list of suspects, and by happy coincidence, the one he deems the most likely candidate has lately come to Gridania. The hunt nears its end, Dermon. 
All that remains is to corner our quarry. Seek out Ilbert near the Adder's Nest. He'll give you the particulars. Should there be any developments in Curthus, you may be sure that I will send word without delay. In the meantime, I wish you success in apprehending the Ivy. Well, thank you. I'll do my best. I don't feel like I've been particularly helpful with that specific problem, but give me time. Ilbert! Ilbert. I'm here to help. My thanks for coming, Scion. Doubtless the commander has informed you, but we have unmasked the ivy. From this point on, we must proceed with extreme caution. Oh, wow. Didn't even need my help. Good for you. Uh, sure. So, um, you, you can whisper, but who is it? Gilbert is convinced that he has discovered the ivy's identity and is preparing to move against the Garlean spy. Listen well. The spy we've been seeking all this time is none other than the Flame Marshal Aline Ryle, Ralbon's second in command. Prior to joining the Immortal Flames, she was a mercenary of no small renown. They say her skill with the polearm has to be seen to be believed. Of Ishgardian birth, she's the highest ranking foreigner in the Immortal Flames, barring the Flame General himself, of course. When he formed the Grand Company, Raban chose people based on their worth, whence they hailed was of no interest. The Monetarists saw things differently, however. Having funded the Enterprise, they reserved the right to reject candidates nominated for high-ranking positions. And it was no secret that they did not favor foreigners, Ishgardians especially, after the way the Holy See forsook the Alliance. Yet the Monetarists did not raise so much as a murmur of protest when Raya was, uh, appointed to her post. I have a lot of trouble pronouncing her name correctly, by the way, <laughs> despite much effort. So I'll probably be like throwing darts all around the target, never quite hitting it, but maybe getting close sometimes. <laughs> Apologies in advance. Passing strange, is it not? Could it be that the Ivy has some hold over the monetarists? Good hiding, bud. But these revelations are secondary to our current mission. A foremost interest to us is Raya's presence here, presence here now. As you may be aware, it is the duty of the Flame Marshal to command the Immortal Flames in the absence of the Flame General. While Raban attended the Council of Alliance leaders, she should have remained in the Hall of Flames. The woman has no business being in Grudania, yet here she is nonetheless, on some pretense. She is up to something, mark my words. Even as we speak, I have a dozen men trawling the flame's records for evidence of Raya's guilt. But if we can catch her red-handed, we shall have all the proof we need. Which brings me to the plan. I have people watching the city gates, the airship landing, and the docks. Every point of egress. She cannot leave without our knowledge. All that remains is to shadow her until she betrays her true purpose. Can I rely upon your eyes, Sion? Oh, certainly. You have my thanks. Let us go then, and take care not to alert our quarry. I'm very small and not noticeable. Fear not. I'll blend right in. See? Invisible. But I can't see her, so I'll go find a bush closer by. Oh. Um. Will this work? Here, I'm invisible. I can't believe that's close enough. <laughs> uh, Raya's headed in the direction of the Blue Badger Gate, with me, Scion. Okay. Sneak, 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 sneak. So busy in this town today. A good crowd to blend into. Nope. Hide. Um. Can't hide well here. That's fine. So, Raya has entered the Carlin Canopy. Meeting someone, perchance? Or could it be she means to board an airship? Pray look to her within. If she's not on the upper floor, try the landing area below. One of mine is stationed there. She may have seen something. Ephemy is her name. I shall remain here in, in case Raya reappears. Okie doke. I'll poke my nose about. Anyone? Anyone at all? Hey, Mioni. Good to see you. Sorry, Scion business. I mean, nothing. Shh, I wasn't here. Ah, 
Yeah, for me. Hello. Dermin Dharami, such an unexpected pleasure. What brings you here? <clears throat> a social visit, you say? How pleasant. No, she didn't come this way. I've noted every passenger and none bore any resemblance. Well, don't let me keep you. I won't. Um, hmm. Hmm, are they upstairs or... Where are they directing me here? Must be upstairs. Ah, to Elbert, of course. Hey. Nowhere to be seen, you say? And you're sure she did not board an airship? Hmm. She did not come back out, either. Where in the seven hells could she have gone? The roost! How could I forget? Greetings, good sir. Might I interest you in some Muntai tonic? A cup a day imbues a man with great vigor, if you take my meaning. <laughs> Perhaps another time, friend. Wait, that necklace. You're a shinobi of Doma. The woman you seek has left Gridania by way of West Shore Pier. She was attired as a merchant, but these eyes were not so easily deceived. You may wish to take your search to the East Shroud. Rest assured that we shall continue to support you from the shadows. Boy, y'all are good. Didn't even need the bushes. Thank the Twelve for the Domans. Were it not for their unique talents, Ryo would have disappeared without a trace. Okay, thank you. The chase is afoot. Uh, Ilbert is eager to resume the pursuit of, of Eileen Ryo. Our hunt leads us to the East Shroud, Sion. I suggest we follow Ryo's example and take the ferry from West Shore Pier. You'll doubtless wish to make certain preparations. See to them while I go on ahead. I shall wait for you at Sweet Bloom Pier. See you there. Okie dokie. Where is this place, anyway? Oh, it's here. They're wanting me to ride the thing from the from the thing. Eh, actually might be faster just going right there. I'll be with you in a second. I arrive. Sorry, the boat was too slow. This way, my friends. Oh, Yugiri. Your quarry makes for the Hawthorne Hut. If Raya is truly the one we seek, we can expect that she means to make contact with her Garlean masters there. An explanation's in order. You are no doubt aware that the Garleans have their own method of communicating over great distances. Well, our ingenious friends at Garland Ironworks have provided us with devices which disrupt these communications, and we've installed them around the city-states. In so doing, we've made it difficult for Imperial agents to correspond with their masters. Raya would thus have no choice but to rendezvous with her Imperial contact directly. Yet, as a well-known face in the Immortal Flames, she cannot move about Thanalan without being recognized. It would only be a matter of time before someone saw through her disguise. Tis for this reason, I believe, that she's chosen the Black Shroud for her clandestine meeting. The Elizen are a common sight here, and her comings and goings are not like to turn any heads. As my scouts tell it, the Garleans have sent agents with a mind to destroy the devices and render such direct contact unnecessary. Fortunately, our shinobi have thus far been successful in rebuffing their efforts. This is it. We need only make for Hawthorne's hut and catch Ryo in the act. Now, obviously, like, there's a proper French pronunciation for that name, which what I'm saying is nowhere close to that. But, uh, usually in uh, Final Fantasy XIV, as has been somewhat confirmed, it seems like, from various French speakers who I've seen in comments, uh, it sounds like the pronunciation of French names in fourteen are fairly kind of English-sized a little bit, or just kind of off. <laughs> no one in the game tries to really go for a proper French accented pronunciation for a lot of names. They just sort of go for a simpler equivalent a lot of the time, which helps me out, I guess, because I'm not very good with lots of French proper pronunciation. Which, yeah, you could probably tell, huh? 
my people report that our quarry has departed for the Bramble Patch. The ivy returns to the gnarls whence she came, but perhaps it's all for the better. To convict someone of her standing, we will require damning evidence against her. What could be better than to catch her in the act when she meets with her Garlean masters? My countrymen and I shall lie in wait in the shadows. Tread warily, my friends. All right. Let's go spring this trap. Yuguri, I'm here to spring the trap. Actually, I'm not really helping with much of anything, so I'm here to spectate. Just beyond, Ryo's in, in conversation with her individual, uh, with an individual clad in the manner of an adventurer, an imperial intermediary, no doubt. This is it, with me. Ready to participate. Flame Marshal Aline Raya, you're under arrest for treason and espionage. You were followed, you bloody fool. Damnation. Boy, the domains are good. What do you need me for? Humph. You're unarmed, my lady, and scarcely garbed for battle. But if you wish to fight, you are welcome to try. What is the meaning of this, Captain? Would you arrest me for strolling in the Twelves Wood? When last I looked, that was no crime and neither was conversing with passing strangers. You would feign ignorance, then. Very well. If you do think of something to say, there will be plenty of time to say it later. Now, come quietly, or I shall make you wish you had. I will offer you no struggle. After all, I have naught to hide. Well, that went smoothly. And I helped. Hey, Yuguri. Even a warrior of Raya's renown could not have hoped to escape by force. Despite her claims, her surrender does not bespeak innocence, but an awareness that her position's untenable. With the ivy thus uprooted, it is to be hoped that the tendrils she entwined around the immortal flames will gradually wither and die. Mayhap then the people of Ulda will have the grand company they deserve. But let us speak of the present. If I may ask, what will you do now, Dermon? I don't know, I actually didn't have any plans after this. So the Scions seek a way into Iceheart's sanctum. Then I dare say you are eager to return to the Rising Stones. Pray do not let me keep you. Fear not, my countrymen and I shall tend to the aftermath. You need not waste your talents here. And speaking of talents, you've been training in the art of the Shinobi, have you not? The change in your bearing is quite evident, to me at least. I look forward to seeing you in action. Till next time, my friend. That's cool. So this game, I don't think I've made mention of this before, this game is actually loaded with a lot of additional dialogue that can happen under certain circumstances, usually depending on what uh, content you have or have not done. That was an extra little line thrown in, uh, because Dermon is a ninja of a certain level, I'd have no idea what level. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that Dermon does have the ninja job unlocked, and he's leveled it a good ways, means that uh, Yugiri actually acknowledges that in conversation, and that's cool. I didn't know that. <laughs> I did not have a ninja leveled when I came through here on my main character, so that's neat. And yeah, like, the game has loads of stuff like that. Increasingly, as the game goes on, I'm doing some Endwalker stuff now, and gosh, there's, like, a lot of dialogue that I'm frequently thinking is like, there's no way that's something that everybody gets. <laughs> Unless they've done specific things. It's cool. Anyway, I gotta go talk to Minfilia.
Hello, Scions. How's everyone doing? Thancred, behaving yourself? Please? Yes, but, Higory, you're not... You're missing the point. The individual doesn't matter. It was a team effort, and I was the one who... Who... What? What are you... What are you trying to explain here, bud? Thancred's tale of Lady Yugiri almost... Uh, uh, tales of Lady Yugiri almost beggar belief. My heart's fair fit to burst from ad admiration. <laughs> oh, he's telling tales of their participation with the whole Leviathan situation. <laughs> you did do a good job, buddy. <laughs> a rousing tale of the comrade's valor. Truly we're fortunate to count Lady Yugiri a friend. You're not impressing anyone, pal. <laughs> Ooh, a contest. <laughs> I could do this all day. All day. <sighs> I can't go on much longer. <laughs> yeah, you've chosen a poor contest again. How do you keep doing this? Maybe challenge one of the kids. I must admit, this exercise of yours never fails to amuse me. While its movements appear comical, it does seem to be having the desired effect. <laughs> Fair. Tataru, you hanging in there? Um, Tataru? What are you doing? Steady, steady. Not bad, huh? With a little more practice, I could earn a fortune at the Ruby Road Exchange. I'm glad you found a little free time. You deserve it. What a talent. She she cannot seriously be considering it. Life as a street performer could be should be one's last resort, not their first. Tatara has grown beyond childish fancies of becoming a songstress. Now she aspires to be to be a legendary street performer. Wait, when did the songstress phase happen? I missed that part. I guess she did sing a lot here and there. <laughs> It's good to have hobbies. We're all too busy here in the Scions. We need more side tasks. I've taken up cooking. Not super good at it yet, but Dermon's getting there. I make my own pretzels now. Hello. What do you need? Welcome back, Dermon. I understand that Alphano had a task for you. Uh, may I ask what it was? Charges of treason and espionage against Aline Ryo. I can scarce believe it. Could there not have been some manner of misunderstanding? No, it avails us not to dwell on it. Whatever the truth may be, we must uh, trust the authorities to uncover it. Let us speak of another matter. I'm pleased to report that we've made progress in our efforts to find a way into Iceheart's sanctum. Oh, well good. Minfilia has never been one to hesitate when it comes to asking others for aid. Now that's true. As you may recall, Iceheart used the Aetherite in the depths of Snowcloak to teleport a short distance to the west, most likely to a sanctuary of some description. It's there that we suspect she means to summon Shiva using the crystals she stole from the House Fortanf caravan. The heretics believe that they are bringing about the second coming of their patron saint. But if, as we suspect, they mean to hold a summoning ritual of the kind employed by the Beast Tribes, it seems likely that the result will be something more akin to a primal. Suffice it to say, they must be stopped, and stop them we shall. But first we must surmount the obstacle that Iceheart has placed in our path. Ordinarily, it would be a simple matter to tap into the established Ethernet and thereby follow our quarry. However, despite our best efforts, we've been unable to ascertain the position of the Aetherite to which she teleported. Our prevailing theory is that she destroyed the second Aetherite upon arrival, a reckless, desperate measure, but also an effective one. After discussing the matter at length with Uriange, we've concluded that we lack the expertise to develop a solution. Which is why we have called upon the aid of one who does possess such ex expertise, a colleague of ours who is currently en route to Revenant's Toll from Charlian. She should be arriving within the hour, in fact. Since you're here, mayhap you could welcome her together, or mayhap we could welcome her together. I'm certain she would appreciate the gesture. Let's make our way to the northern gates and await her coming. Oh, sounds good. A new friend. Very good. To the gates! Do, 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 do. Here we are. What manner of woman is she, I wonder? We've spoken before via Link Pearl, of course, but it's not the same. That's true. I too am excited to meet her.
Minfilia, am I right? None other. I bid you welcome to Revenant's Toll, and thank you for traveling so far on such short notice. <laughs> As if I could ever say no to Uriange. Moonbreeder is an accomplished Charlian scholar and an authority on etherite technologies. She has played an invaluable role in our search for a means to capture Arsian souls. Charmed, I'm sure. And so tall. Hello. Pleasure to meet you. I'm Dermin. For an outpost in an ether rich wasteland, this place is a good deal livelier than I expected. Just goes to show you, you never know until you know. Let us return to the Rising Stones at once, then. We have much to discuss. I'm very interested in this conversation. Is that Tupsimati on the back wall there? I'm amazed you managed to find all the pieces after... Well, you know. Ah, yes. Louisois' staff. I do love this display of it back there. It's really cool. Good detail. Anyway, let's discuss. Moon! Gods, it's been ages! Oh, longer, sister. A joyous reunion indeed. Well, of course it is. Moon and I are like twin sisters. Save in appearance and aptitude. Oh, look at the gang all together. Everyone, if I could have your attention. We have with us an esteemed guest who has come from Shalian to assist us. I bid Moonbreeder join us here that she might share with us her extensive knowledge of etherites. Also, as many of you are already aware, she has been overseeing our research into white orosite, a sample of which she has been good enough to bring with her. Well, I had to come, didn't I? You'd have to be bloody daft to turn your nose up at a chance like this. Where better to conduct my final tests than a land so steeped in ether you can taste it? Tis plain the passage of the years hath done little to dampen thy youthful spirits. And nothing at all to reform thy youthful manner. Jay, where in the hells have you been hiding? Ah, uh, unhand me. She will not. I come all this way, and that's what you have to say to me. I much preferred when you were pleading with me to drop everything and hurry to your side. What was it you said? None save thee can satisfy this need. Go on. Thine artless attempts to misrepresent mine all too innocent motives do thee little credit. I do adore. So, like, A Realm Reborn, a lot of the characters, as we've been introduced to them, have been a little bit stiff and not fully fleshed out. Some of my favorite moments are when they do little things like this that kind of humanize them and also, like, knock them down a peg. <laughs> Some characters need it more than others. <clears throat> Mine intent, as well thou knowest, was but to impress upon thee the gravity of the circumstance. Lest thou doubt, a deiform entity shall shortly be summoned, save if thou and no other grantest my compeers thine aid. You still haven't found it, then, your missing etherite? We have not. No. We know that Iceheart teleported to an etherite not far from the first. Yet even after careful analysis, we could not locate the second beacon. 
We now suspect that the heretics destroyed the second etherite to impede our pursuit. Our allies continue to scour Snowcloak for Ice Hot Sanctuary, but we have no guarantee that they will find it. Yet it must be found, for even now Ice Hot prepares to call upon Saint Shiva. I'm sorry, but if the etherite's been destroyed, then that's that. Although, you're absolutely sure she used the first etherite, are you? She didn't just use teleportation magics? One of our own bore witness to her escape. I can say with absolute certainty that Iceheart used the Aetherite. Confirmed. In that case, there might be a way, so long as the ethereal current is still flowing. Truly? How? We use the current to recreate the beacon. As you know, etherites are a bit like lighthouses. We use them to reconstitute our physical forms when crossing the ethereal sea. Without them, we'd lose all sense of direction and our essence would dissipate. However, we don't rely solely on these beacons. There are currents of ether which flow between them, currents which help guide us to our destination. Now, these currents will gradually dwindle away to nothing if an etherite is destroyed. But, if even a sluggish flow remains, we could theoretically use it to direct a surge of concentrated ether towards the void left by the beacon, and thereby fill it up again. Like opening the floodgates to fill a dry riverbed. Though, correct me if I'm wrong, but would we not need a veritable reservoir of ether? In concert, we might manage to channel a sufficient volume, yet that is not my chief concern. To direct the flow of so great a volume of ether with the requisite precision would be a nigh-impossible task in itself. I barely succeeded in facilitating travel to an unattuned beacon. That which you describe sounds considerably more difficult. And dangerous! Every person who has attempted to teleport in this fashion has died in the process. They, however, did not have white aura sight at their disposal. I can use it to channel all the ether you can give me into the etherite. However, white aura sight cannot retain ether for an extended period of time, so we would need to infuse it immediately beforehand. Just so you know, I'd confidently give this plan better than even odds of success. And if the worst comes to worst, your people won't suffer. Though it risked the lives of our best and brightest, we have not the time to seek other options. If the ethereal current still flows, we shall carry out Moonbreeder's plan. That's the spirit. Let's roll the dice. Well, we're going to get Gamble teleported. We're small. It'll be fine. Uh, a plan has been devised, and Minfilia would have it carried out without further delay. I've already informed Alphino of our plan to recreate the beacon in the manner Moonbreeda described. He agreed that, despite the inherent danger, it represents our only hope of success. He also said that he wished to meet with you at Snowcloak before proceeding. I expect you'll find him waiting for you there when you arrive. I want you to know that I appreciate everything you've done on our behalf, Dermon, and I have faith you will return to us, as you always have. Oh, y'all got nothing to worry about. There's so much 14 left, are you kidding me? Can't die now. Sit tight, Alphino, I'm on my way. Don't freeze to death before I get there. I swear, do you need me to buy you a sweater? Good to see you, Derman. I was starting to wonder if you were having second thoughts. Captain Ilbert sends his regards, by the way. He attends to the interrogation of Eileen Ryle in Ulda even as we speak. But I shall not distract you from the matter at hand. We can discuss the ivy upon your return. I trust that... by which I mean to say... the others are waiting for us at the Aetherite. After you, Sion. I'll be fine, buddy.
There. It's ready. It worked, I think. Try attuning to the ether right now. Feel for the current and try to locate the beacon. We've done all we can, Dermon. For now, let us withdraw. When your final preparations are complete, you must seek out the beacon we've created. If, by the grace of the Twelve, you arrive safely, you must stop Iceheart before she summons Shiva. I'll do my best. I sense another primal battle coming. We cannot ignore the possibility that our actions have alerted Iceheart to our plans. Should that be the case, she may attempt to hasten the completion of the summoning ritual, and if she succeeds, you will have little choice but to face Shiva in battle. Knowing little of this saint, I can't say if your own strength will suffice, and so I'd encourage you to call upon your allies. Some may have reservations about waging their lives in the or wagering their lives on the success of Moonbreda's experiment, but others will surely agree that desperate times call for desperate measures. Ah, before you assemble your party, pray speak with that knight. I believe he has a message for you from Sir Emmerich. Oh, uh, which knight? Who are we talking about? Oh, here you are. Hello. Sir, Sir Emmerich regrets that he could not be here in person and asks that I read you this letter. <clears throat> Ishgard faces an unprecedented threat, yet in our hour of need, it is not her knights who stand poised to defend her. Dermond Dirami, the warrior of light, savior of Eorzea, your deeds this day shall not be forgotten. Where others would flee, you choose to remain. Where others would falter, you rise to the challenge. Where others would use their gifts for selfish ends, you wield yours in service to a greater cause. May Halone bless you with good fortune and see you safely home. Oh, nice. Well, all right. You know, let's go ahead and save this battle for next time, since there's probably going to be some cutscenes and whatnot and we've been going for a little bit. Y'all, when I see you next time, we will go for a Shiva fight. Sound good? Do take care of yourselves until then, and goodbye.